All right, so my good people, we are back, and this is going to be our very first screencast for fourth quarter. And I do want to remind you that we are going to be moving pretty quickly as we make our way through this quarter. Uh, we are going to be looking today at Chapter 21, and Chapter 21 is going to focus on the hexapods. And the hexapods include those animals that actually have six legs. And I should be more specific, those arthropods that have six legs. And so in this case, we're talking about the insects. Now we're not going to spend a lot of time on this um, particular group of animals just because of the um, time constraints that we have for fourth quarter and the other material that we need to get through, but um, we will spend a little bit of time introducing these animals, giving you a little bit of information on the characteristics you would find in this group and how you could compare those um, characteristics to the um, other arthropods that we had looked at back in chapter 19 and chapter 20. So taking a look at our first slide, you're going to notice again we have the subphylum hexapoda. And again, we're talking about animals that actually have six legs. And so we're talking about an invertebrate. And you can see that the name itself does imply six. When we look at the prefix, hex, of course, means six. And it is a subphylum. So we are talking about the phylum arthropoda still. So we're still looking at those animals that tend to have a pretty significant exoskeleton and obviously some other characteristics that we've looked at that kind of tie these animals together. Now again, as we had said, the members are named for the presence of six legs as compared to the um, arachnids that we had looked at in um, the previous chapters. They had eight, and the crustaceans, of course, had sometimes a large number of legs. Um, if you think about the crayfish that you had looked at, they had actually five pairs of walking legs, and then, of course, various other appendages. Now, what makes this particular group a little bit different is that their legs are actually uniramous. In other words, they do not have the branching pattern that we had seen in the previous um, subphylum. And so instead of being biramous, they're uniramous. Now, there are three tagmata, in other words, three segments that you would find in these animals. So we have a head, we have a thorax, and we have an abdomen. So if you come over here to the right, you're going to notice, of course, the head is pretty obvious. You can see that located right here. The thorax is going to be where you will find the majority of the legs and the wings attached. Then, of course, we have the abdominal region, which is um, towards the um, posterior region of the animal. Now, something that's really kind of different between these animals and the ones we have looked at previously in 19 and 20 is that, of course, they do have an exoskeleton, which means the skeleton on the outside, but their skeleton is a little bit different because their skeleton is composed of very complex plates or sclerites. And these sclerites are connected by hinge joints. And a lot of times you can't really see where these joints are located in these animals because sometimes they're going to be hidden. Now, if you think back to the crustaceans, we had an exoskeleton on these animals that was really heavy duty. In other words, it tended to be very thick and almost... Um, um, almost impossible to penetrate, but the rigidity that you're going to find in the insects, in other words, the stiffness that you would find in their exoskeleton, is not going to be due to any of the mineral matter that you might have seen in the crustaceans. Their exoskeleton is primarily made up of scleroprotein. Now, this scleroprotein is going to allow these animals to have a much lighter um, body weight than you would find in the crustaceans. Because remember, the crustaceans had that sort of um, calcium based. Um, exoskeleton in, in some of the animals that we had looked at. And so, of course, that made the body really heavy. So we're going to have members of this group that will be able to take flight. And if you're going to be able to fly, you need to make sure that you um, definitely have a way to significantly reduce that body weight. And so that's what these scleroproteins are going to do for this group of animals. So in this particular group of animals, you're going to have a head that's going to vary depending on the type of insect that you're looking at. And if you look over here on the right, you're going to notice that we have an example of a silkworm larvae. And this is going to be the adult form of this particular insect. This is going to be a silkworm moth. And you can see the difference between the two heads here. And you can see a Japanese beetle down right below. You can see this compared to the um, checkered beetle off to the right. And we have an example of a yellow jacket. Then we have an example of a fly. So all of these you can see um, vary quite a bit in the way that um, head region is presented. But looking at what's kind of similar between the, um, the groups, you're going to notice that usually the head is going to be equipped with a very large um, set of compound eyes. And when we talk about a compound eye, we're talking about an eye that actually has many lenses. And in addition to those compound eyes, you're going to find um, insects only having one pair 
of antennae. Um, you can compare that to the crustaceans that we had looked at back in chapter 20, and those um, crustaceans actually had two pairs of antennae. We had the antennae and we had the antennules. Now the function of these antennae in insects is going to vary. It could function as a sense of touch for these animals, it could function in taste, and it could definitely function in the way that these animals perceive sound in their environment. Now, in addition to the head varying a bit, you can also um, expect that the mouth parts for these animals are going to vary as well, because when you look at the way these animals feed, um, they have quite a variety of um, different feeding habits. But there are some standard parts that you're going to find in all insects, and the first part is one called a labrum. And down here towards the right, you can see the labrum right here. And the labrum is primarily there to sort of support or to hold on to the food that these animals are consuming. Now, we've talked about the mandibles and the maxilla in the crustaceans, and if you notice, they function pretty much the same when you look at the insects. Um, they're primarily there to sense, and so the maxilla would be there to sense the environment, sense the type of food that are being um, consumed by the insects. And of course, mandibles, being very solid, being very hard, are going to be there to chew up the food. And over here on the right again, you can see an example of a mandible right here. Again, looks very similar to what you saw in the crayfish. And um, the maxillae, um, you can see right down here. Again, somewhat similar to what you had seen in the crayfish. But again, they're basically there to sort of sense the environment, maybe to bring food to the mouth of the insect. Now, you're also going to have a part called a labium. And this particular part is going to be used to manipulate the food. Again, maybe position the food. Um, correctly so the animal can actually consume it and the labium is going to be right here and again there's going to be what we call labial palps and that's what you see right here they're going to be associated with this part now one part that is not represented over here on the right is a part called the hypopharynx and its main function is to help the animal in swallowing whatever food it happens to be consuming and a lot of times that hypopharynx is going to be sort of hidden right around this area of the animal. When you guys actually um, tear apart your um, grasshoppers in lab, um, one of the things I'm going to have you do is to actually remove all of these mouth parts and you should be able to see the hypopharynx in that animal. Now when you look at the way this animal is put together, you're going to notice that the thorax region of the animal is going to be broken down into three parts. And what we have is we have one called the prothorax, we have the mesothorax, and we have the metathorax. And over here on the right, you can see the metathorax right here in this area of the animal. You can see the mesothorax located right here. And again, the prothorax is going to be right here. All right. Now, each section is going to have its own pair of legs. And so that's kind of a way that you can identify where these sections fall. So you can see the metathorax has these really kind of pretty sturdy um, hind legs. You can see the mesothorax would be right about um, right about here. You can see this middle part or this middle area uh, of the pair of legs. And you can see the prothorax, of course, being towards the anterior region, are going to have this front pair of legs. And so that's one of the easiest ways to identify um, each of these different um, areas of the thorax. Now, if this um, insect has wings, typically there's going to be two pairs of wings that are going to be present and they're going to be located on the mesothorax and the metathorax region of the insect. And so, so over here you can see the two pairs of wings and you have what we call a forewing and you have a hind wing. And this forewing is right about here. So it's right about where you would see this mesothorax region. And this hind wing is going to be located in the metathorax um, area of the animal. Now, most of the wings are going to consist sort of of a double membrane type of structure. And something that's pretty typical of insect wings is you see sort of the venation that occurs in these wings. And this is going to help to sort of strengthen um, the wing itself. In other words, give it integrity. And for scientists, it's going to be used actually to help them identify what taxa um, that insect might belong to. Now, depending on the group of insects that we're looking at, we're going to look at, again, a variety of legs. So, so far, we looked at a variety of heads, definitely a variety of mouth parts, and you're going to see a variety of legs in this group. So, if you notice, the walking legs are going to end in what we call a terminal pad or a claw. 
Now, of course, that's going to vary depending on the type of habitat that that animal actually lives in. Now, the hind legs of grasshoppers, of course, are going to be pretty significant because they're really enlarged so this animal can jump. And you can see they're really in heavily um, muscular region of this very large hind leg that you would find in the grasshopper. Um, an animal like you would see down here, like a bee for example, really doesn't um, have any need for that type of body arrangement. So the four legs of a praying mantis, again sort of another variety of legs you would see in insects, is going to be enlarged so you can actually allow that animal to grasp its prey. And over here on the right you can see an example of a praying mantis and um, you can see the um, four limbs that are pretty significant, they're pretty large, again they're used for grasping things. Now another example would be the honeybees that you see over here on the right and their legs have been modified so they can actually allow the animal to collect pollen. And so these adaptations again are primarily based on the type of environment that you're going to find these insects in. Now, of course, when you talk about the appendages of these animals, you need to talk about um, what do they use them for. Of course, they're going to use them for various um, ways of obtaining food, um, possibly defense, but of course, we can't ignore that they definitely use them for locomotion. And so, in this case, when you talk about how these insects are going to walk, um, they sort of have a unique way that they walk. What they're going to do is they're going to use their first and the last leg on one side of the body and actually the middle leg on the opposite side and they're going to alternate back and forth um, as they walk throughout their environment. Now, of course, as we had said, the power of flight, a lot of insects do take flight. In other words, that's one of the ways they can actually move throughout their environment. And we had said they do have, tend to have two pairs of wings. And there is one exception to that, the um, group that we call the dipterans. These are considered the true flies. They only have one pair of wings. And you can see an example of the dipterans over here on the right hand side. Now the wings can be modified depending on again um, the animal itself and the adaptations for that particular environment. Um, most of the time if you have wings that are definitely for flight they're going to be very thin and very membranous. In other words you don't want to put a lot of a weight into those wings because that would definitely um, hinder the ability of that animal to fly. But there are actually some insects out there, beetles for example, that have a very thick and what they consider horny kind of a weird way to say that, uh, front wing. And if you notice down here you can see this would be an example of that very tough outer wing. And it's basically there to protect the more delicate, thin, and membranous wings that you would find underneath that are used for flight. Butterflies have wings that are going to be covered with scales. So if you've ever um, captured like a moth or a butterfly, you sort of get that powdery um, stuff that you would find on your fingers. Well, that's going to be the scales, and you can see up here on the right, that you've rubbed off those wings. And so for this group, butterflies and moths, you're going to see sort of a scaly type structure for these wings. Now, another example would be something called a caddis fly, and sometimes you find those in, in very wet, aquatic environments and this is a situation where you actually have wings that might be covered with very small hairs. So that's going to finish up our very first screencast for chapter 21. Now as I had said at the very end of third quarter it's really important that you have this screencast and the second screencast completed before you come to class on Tuesday after spring break. We do begin with the B day so I will see you on that day and I would like to get into lab on that day as well. So please make sure these study guides are completed before you come to class.